genre and the ways social and technological context influences music, about the way it's composed and the way it's performed. We know about the origins of opera in the, with the Medici's in Florence, and we know about the way the febrile culture in Weimar Germany produced that whole wave of modernism, and we know about how amplification created the whole rock and roll revolution in the mid 60s. We know an awful lot about the way uh, our context can influence music. So, well, what we don't know yet, we've got no idea about yet, is how these new contexts that we're inventing now, the social networks and the massively interconnected world of the internet, we know very little about how these new contexts will influence both how we create music and how it's performed and consumed. So, to that end, because we don't know much about that, I've asked Peter Gregson to come along. Peter's a cellist, but also a composer, and these days also a kind of a technologist. And he's going to tell us about a project that, uh, that he's uh, initiated in partnership with another composer called Daniel Jones, and also the Ensemble of Britain Sinfonia from Albra. And uh, uh, I think what I should do now is just hand over to Peter Gregson. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of couple of little corrections for Mr. Bobrick. Uh, <laughs> so yes, just edit, edit out the corrections. <laughs> we can edit these out, but just for clarity, because I'm going to refer to them later on. Uh, Daniel Jones is a technology guy, a code writer, um, and Britain's Pony in Cambridge. But other than that, it's all, all good. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so thanks very much. Um, Yes, so I'm a cellist and composer. Uh, I work with a lot of technology and technologists. I started um, when I was at college, I was at the Royal Academy just along the road, and started working with the Media Lab at MIT, looking at ways to um, control sound using new tools and new technology. And, um, but today I'm going to talk to you about a piece of music I wrote for the space, which again I'm going to sort of assume we all know what the space is. Good. Um, and the piece is called Listening Machine. So the listening machine is a data sonification, which is essentially turning a live set of data into music. Um, and the, the reason this, this all came about was I was sitting talking to a friend of mine who at the time was the chief scientist at Twitter in San Francisco, a guy called Abdur Chowdhury. And uh, he was talking about this unimaginably large data set that they had, it's absolutely astronomical. And he talked about it in the same way that we talk about music. So he was talking about the orchestration of data. He was talking about the, the image, like sort of stereo image or position of data. Talking about um, you know, tempo and velocity, volume. And I rather naively and margarita -ly, uh, thought, well, this would be quite simple to, to map one to the other. You know, you've got this, I've got that. Brilliant, done. Um, it, it ended up not being quite as simple as that, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but the, you know, the point with, with this, the thing that made it exciting to me, was data visualization uh, is everywhere. You, know, you can't open The Guardian for more than two pages without seeing some kind of interesting statistic mapped against a pretty little graph. Um, but it creates a snapshot in time. It doesn't have any fluidity to it. It doesn't get a sense of... Um, of interaction and humanity in, in that data. It's just a static point in time. And which is the great thing with music is it's linear, it keeps going, it's, it's got depth, it's got time, and it's got volume. Uh, so we've got more ways of mapping it. Um, and anything that we were going to start looking at, I was very keen that it was going to reflect the human phrasing of something like Twitter. Um, individual notes and kind of weird static events weren't really very interesting in the same way that Twitter isn't about individual letters and individual words. It's about conversations and feelings and thoughts and um, kittens and stuff. And, you know, it also had to be for real instruments because real instruments sound better. And uh, that, that actually was the part that made it the biggest challenge, but actually also made it the most rewarding thing to listen to. Um, there are quite a lot of data sonifications out there. That it's not we didn't invent this field, uh, but what Dan did manage to bring uh, was the most remarkable way of creating something that really does sound like a pre-composed phrase and a really melodic and musical structure. 
um, to life. And for a piece of music that runs for six months, that's quite impressive. Um, so from my point of view, it was guided largely through naive optimism. I thought this would be quite good fun and it would be cool. Um, had really no idea quite how much we'd have to learn and, and quite how many late nights uh, there would be. So, so we all know about space and the digital commission platform, blah, blah, blah. Um, but in my line of work, we often get asked, I often get asked, um, why? You know, anything with digital as a prefix or 2.0 as a suffix, um, you get asked why. But you don't really hear too many people asking Wordsworth why he wrote about clouds or Britain why he wrote about the sea. It, it's a slightly awkward transition point where it looks all very new and shiny and, and it kind of feels far different to, to any other kind of um, abstract composition. I would still refer to this as largely abstract composition. Um, it also isn't a bait and switch, and so by that I mean it's not about creating this, this kind of cool shiny thing on the internet and saying, and now go to the concert hall, and now go to the Wigmore Hall. The whole point of this was that it was a, a natively digital, site-specific piece um, that just exists. There's no ulterior motive. Um, it isn't trying to push people to go to see the Queen Elizabeth Hall or King's Place or, or Wigmore, wherever it is. Um, it's just living where it lives, doing its little thing. It's also not an archival work, and uh, this is something we're going to come back to in a second. Uh, so, documenting a painting online, there are a lot of digital art galleries, um, I think there's some on the space. Um, I'm always interested in that, is that a painting or are you actually looking at a photograph of a painting? Who do you credit? Um, watching a play, you know, the York Mystery Plays on the space again were phenomenal, but are you actually watching a film? Or are you watching a play? Um, I would contend this this doesn't have an alternative. This isn't played live. This isn't a digitised recording of a piece of music. And this is kind of interesting. Um, my uh, slightly shitty new media term for this would be digital impermanence. We can turn this off. It can't be pirated. Uh, it's, it ends on October 31st and we're not recording it. Um, so it started on May, when did the space start? May 5th. Started on May the 5th in that case, and it started like a week later. Um, and it will finish. And there's something nice about that. You know, it feels, that feels like a human thing. Stuff doesn't last forever. Um, you know, things do degrade in real life. So why shouldn't they, why can't we approach that in a digital world? Um, yeah, and you know, real people listen to this. They're not numbers, they're not users, they're not statistics. And we wanted to find that kind of frailty and sort of human quality to the otherwise sort of obsessively quantified web. <coughs> so, behind me are these sort of little pretty pictures made by uh, a guy, the graphics are done by a guy called Joe Hales, who's a, a book designer. And so we wanted the listening machine to look like a 1930s science textbook, kind of when it was all really exciting and you know, things were still being discovered, it was all very, very cool and mechanical and clunky. So, at the core of the listening machine is a Mac Mini, just a tiny little computer running three pieces of custom software and Ableton Live. Uh, and it's following the Twitter activity of 500 people in the UK, um, selected proportionally from eight topic groups, which are the BBC News topic categorizations. So, it's arts, business, education, health politics, science, sport, and technology. Um, and a further group of this is selected at random. So 10% from each of those eight, and then a further discretionary 20%, um, which is where you, you, you know, you kind of Stephen Fry's and um, Boingos and stuff fit in. And so whenever these people post an update on Twitter, uh, the listening machine reads these in real time uh, in both terms of sound and meaning and generates music based on that. Now, by generate, it's not random. I have written potential music for this. So the piece runs for six months. To write six months of music would take a long time. To record it would, funnily enough, take at least six months. And we had six weeks. Um, <clears throat> so we had to come up with ways of creating a piece of music that wouldn't become repetitive, that wouldn't sound the same all the time, but had a coherent aesthetic 
and have thematic materials so that people could access it again and again. It's not completely random, it's not, in fact it's not random at all. Um, so this music was written and then recorded by the Britain Symphonia, and I'll come back to how we recorded that in a second. So the listening machine reads these tweets and it's looking for three very simple things. So from the top left, it looks at uh, classification. So is it, you know, what's, what topic is it, is it about? Is it about um, education, health? Um, it's quite a lot about education today uh, when we were looking at it during the sound check. Um, the different topics throw up different melodic structures and different harmonic structures, so different potential melodies and different potential rules of music that can be put together. Um, and also different orchestrations, so different combinations of instruments in different stereo images. Uh, then it goes to the right, it goes to the triangle of happiness, and it looks at the sentiment. And so we've got some really advanced sentiment analysis running on this, uh, which is a natural language processing Python script written by Dan, uh, Dan Jones. And so is it positive, top left, uh, top, negative, or objective? So I like this chair, I don't like this chair, and it's a chair. Those all influence the musical properties of the potential themes that have been set. So positive is major, negative is minor, and objective is modal. So this then changes the flavour of the piece. But the really clever bit that makes this sound human and, uh, and tactile and makes it sound like I wrote an awful lot more than I actually did, um, it reads the messages. So it's got what's called prosody analysis. So for example, the sentence in front of me is, it's prosody or rhythm or speech and intonation. So it's accounting for the fact that not all vowels are equal, not all consonants are equal. Punctuation means something. Currently in data visualization, uh, it will just say, right, you've got an I-T-S-P-R-O-S-O-D-Y, and it's a very flat, meaningless thing. And again, my naive optimism was very, very intent that it was going to know what this stuff meant. Not all E's are the same. And as a string player, not all notes are the same. An F-sharp in D major is sharper than an F-sharp in B minor, for example. It's got harmonic implications, it's got melodic implications. So there's this very clever bit of script um, which reads the messages. And so it separates it down into vowels and consonants for starters. So it would look at it and say, um, and trick with different letters to as if it was something else. Um, so we've got diphthongs, we've got monophthongs, we've got um, the I in Italy is different to the I in I. So I triggers a kind of I and indigo would go I. Those pictures, I'll come back to how we did that, that was a bit obsessive as well. Um, but this influences the orchestration again and the rhythm. So the consonants are then triggering to get this kind of da 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 You get these really natural rhythms which are then locked to a larger grid. So it does trigger in time um, and it doesn't just sound like noise. Uh, largely because language and music are both about phrasing and communication. They're not alphabets and building blocks. Um, looking at it as just isolated letters and isolated sentences wasn't really a uh, kind of linguistically sophisticated way of looking at it, in the same way that looking at a piece of music and saying it's a D major scale is not a particularly sophisticated way of looking at a piece of music. So this is using, the, the analogy I like, is it's using a million straight lines to make a circle. We're trying to create something really fluid using really strict, very structured rules and sort of automated in a, in, to a certain degree. And I think the reason that this is Sort of relevant to this sort of talk series is that this is my compositional aesthetic written into a piece of code. So this is code with a compositional aesthetic, which is quite an exciting thing. So I'm not sitting at this computer. The computer's somewhere in Camberwell, I think, um, and it's it's just churning this stuff out over and over again. And any time I listen into it, it's I think, yeah, yeah, I'm not 
ashamed to have my name associated with that. Um, and every once in a while, you know, a few emails go back and forth saying, can we make the E-flats in the violin a bit quieter? <laughs> uh, we've got this level of control, um, which is really, really amazing. Um, mixing it was a nightmare, but I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so the music you hear, which I'm going to play in a minute, is pulled from material that was written for vowels, topic themes, keyword themes, consonants, both voiced and unvoiced, um, field recordings, um, sampler machines, which adds a very quick level of depth. Uh, so quickly, um, we've got some fun ones. There's one called the Reichermat, which is a generative Steve Reich machine. Um, it's absolutely terrifying. Um, it really does Steve Reich very well. <laughs> um, uh, well, it does my opinion of Steve Reich very well. Um, uh, a thing called the Lally phone, which is a human voice which plays consonants without the vowels. So you get these very haunting words playing and uh, things. Uh, then the instrumental glissatron, which c covers us for um, the in between the notes things. So if it doesn't quite know what topic theme it's playing, or quite, whether it's major or minor, you're going to get this really kind of nice, like, <laughs> kind of little human um, corner cutting mechanism where it's thinking. Um, and all, all told, this gives you 43,966 discrete pieces of music that somehow were written and recorded in two weeks, and all performed by real humans uh, playing real music. The slight um, nerdy point about the music writing is everything works with everything else. So every single vowel, every single consonant, every single everything potentially works with everything else. And the way we came to do that was having to, you actually have to do that in six keys, which is, which is quite nice. Um, but it still, it means that per day we were having to record just under 7,000 bars of, of um, just unique material, um, which we had algorithmic ways of generating those scores. Um, all the source material was written originally by me, but then to chunk out every single variation, it's just grunt work, so we ship that off to a computer. Um, so we've got these, these pieces of music that all combine and all live together in this computer in, in various different guises, different ways, and it's not in sonata form, um, or it's not a symphony. Some people have been trying to say, oh, it's a Twitter symphony. It's like, no, it's really not. Can we really not say that? <laughs> um, but I don't think it, that's a problem. You know, that's not a thing. Um, it's, it's the musical representation of, of human conversations and human emotions. Um, it's, it's got a very distinct aesthetic. It really has its own kind of tonal language. Um, and I think that's really what matters. Um, the audio nerd in me and the audio nerd in, in other people that we've talked this to, and um, they always ask how you mix something like this. So when you come to mixing something, it's not because you've finished it and you know what you've got. Um, yeah, I'd say we have, all told it will be, I think Jake Berg, Jared upstairs worked out, it was going to be 19 terabytes of music, uh, or 15, it's something that's an astronomical lot, but it's six months of music. And so mixing that's going to be difficult. Um, and again, naivety comes, comes to, the, to the win. Um, and so decided that actually what we were going to do was make the best sounding violin. We had a whole chamber orchestra, right? So it's quite a lot of material. So we was going to make the best sounding violin and the best sounding oboe and the best sounding cello. And actually that, that kind of works. Um, it, it pains me thinking of the hours I spent in mixing studios, but it really, actually, it has yet to distort. Uh, everything's very clear. Everything sits in its own space. I'm sure there are things we could tweak, but um, yeah, it worked. So I'm going to play it to you in a second. Um, as I think you might have, uh, through some slightly garbled, semi jet lagged kind of explanation, it's quite complex under the hood. Uh, the listening machine is quite sophisticated at a nerd level. Um, but at the front end, it's actually very human and it is very simple. It's a piece of music about Britain. Um, it's gnarly in the morning, it's busy at lunchtime, and it's really ambient and chilled out in the evening. 
uh, which is controlled by the rate. So you get this very beautiful human playlist to the day, and it flows very nicely and it's very kind of um, it's very representative and it's actually not entirely um, it's not what you'd hear on Radio One. You know, it doesn't try and pick you up in the morning. It's it, it's quite angry and a bit kind of hissy. Um, but there is an interesting kind of semantic question which I'd like to ask, which I'd like to come back to at the end, uh, around composition as we currently define it, uh, which is the ordering and structuring of sound, so I'm told. So I wrote the source material. I have the bags under my eyes to prove it. Um, but it's ordered and structured by the public. It's ordered and structured by Twitter. Um, so if we agree it's uncontestable that I wrote the material, are they merely triggering that, so are they performing this? Or if we want to go down the competition is the ordering and structuring of sound, are they composing it? Have I just written a dictionary? And so this was put out, there's no one here from PRS, is there? No. <laughs> this was, this, I did stupidly say this um, at some event, uh, actually it was future everything, and um, someone, in the audience was from PRS and said, oh, I'm going to get back to you on that one. And right enough, they did. And um, there's, a, there's a kind of theoretical position that the listening machine, as in the listening machine, three pieces of software, um, could both earn and be, it could both pay as a broadcaster and also collect as a composer. <laughs> Sorry, as a performer and a composer. <laughs> um, but funnily enough, it's a website. Like it's doesn't have a bank account. <laughs> so let's have a quick listen. The joys of modern technology. Are we going to listen live? We are going to listen live, but we're going to listen live in a very convoluted way because 3G has come to the win. There's an issue with the Wi Fi stuff. So, what we have here this is the website, um, and these little mechanical cogs and doobies churn around all day long showing you. Uh, this was actually an idea from, I think, Peter Manura um, about access. So it's a piece of music, but what if you can't hear? So what, what does this kind of public swell look like? So that, this is what set us on this. It was, this is actually a lot of work, which I had nothing to do with. It's great. Um, so these little visualizers show you the topic. They show you the rate. Uh, so it's not very active at the moment. It's quite kind of passive. You're probably going to hear a bit of percussion, the occasional violin line. Um, business and health, probably sound. And it's, it's sort of average, it's, it's hovering toward, oh, there it's moving. Oh, it's kind of neutral, okay. So, here we go. And there's this moment of, is it gonna sound terrible? Every once in a while, right. from. Um, 
it's, it's the idea that somehow the future, it's about somehow the past is somehow preferable to the present. Just flipping it around and turning it, it's the idea that somehow the future is preferable to now. You know, the, what we're able to achieve right now is absolutely incredible. Um, but you know, this future, that, looking at Twitter, there was a big conference on the last few days about uh, digital connectivity and the arts and all this, and funding, funnily enough. And um, it's a lot of blame around what people want to happen. You know, what if we could dream big? And what if we could do these things? Actually, there's nothing stopping anything to happen. Like this was relatively cheap. Um, it was also relatively quick. Um, but the thing that was exciting for me about the space and about actually being able to realise this project, which I'd been sitting on for a little while, uh, was that it was highly mobile and not just that it works in my, on my phone, in my pocket sort of way, although it is that as well. Um, I mean, it was fast paced. Like we had to get on with it and make it happen. We couldn't just go and sit and look at the Tibetan mountains and wait for divine inspiration. Um, you know, it's sort of art in beta. We are changing things every once in a while. Things do evolve, they do change. Uh, so it's, it's really, it's kind of fluid. Um, I'm also unlikely to play to as many people in the concert hall as our listening to listening machine at the moment. Uh, it, it got quite popular um, at one point or other. <laughs> and, uh, but it isn't about these numbers. The thing that's really exciting is, the, is that people care about it. They really care. Like they keep coming back. We've got a 70 something percent return rate uh, of, of returning visitors. Um, but the really fun one is we've got this kind of feedback loop. Every once in a while it does go down. Every once in a while the server just doesn't quite stay up. Um, but we get a slurry of tweets from people and emails within sort of five or six minutes of this happening. You know, so people are listening at, and they really want to be hearing it. They stay for a long time as well. Um, people start remixing it. There's a group, there was a group, I haven't looked at it recently, there was a group on SoundCloud of people that had taken little extracts and they, they don't do very much with it. Uh, there was one guy who just added a reverb. I thought, hmm. <laughs> that feels easy, but uh, you know, good for him for trying. Um, but you know, the other thing with the space uh, and as I say, the commission was uh, we're always challenged sort of sell side. Uh, we're always being challenged by funding bodies to create relevant work. Um, however, that is defined. I'm not sure. Uh, but for the first time, this really felt like the funding bodies were making a, a relevant funding platform. It felt like a an interesting way to work. Um, with the only exception that the individuals that work on these projects all had to partner up to organisations as opposed to organisations partnering across to individuals, but that's another that's another uh, thing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you very much for listening. I'm wondering if you have some sort of questions or and there's one at the back. Uh, yes. We're following 500. If you visualise that, mm -hmm. so that in real time, as the tweet triggers the music, would there be too many tweets coming through to make it coherent? Would it be too fast for you to read? Because that would be the logical next visualisation. You hear the music and you see the tweet. Mm. Can you tr repeat that question? Yeah, yeah sure. Mic, sorry. Um, so could we create a, a real time visualise with the same sort of the same parameters yeah. that it's looking at. In other words, you see Stephen Price tweet and you immediately hear what that tweet triggers. <laughs> we, we did, in, in, in staging it and in kind of selling it to various partners that we needed to sell it to, um, we did isolate it. And also because we hadn't recorded it and built it, we had to do it with individual messages and then small groups and build it up and up and up. And they sound really good. I mean, the other thing we've been doing at various conferences is sonifying conference hashtags. And the type of people that get into that type of thing, get into that. <laughs> they love it. Um, but it ends up being a lot of visual noise. And the thing that was really nice about this was you're not actually sitting reading every tweet. You kind of get this collective ambient bustle and you pick up on key topics and key themes from the people you've chosen to follow on your own feed. 
So this felt like a fairly human way of doing that. You know, it's um, visualizing it. Yeah, I'm sure we, I'm, we, I'm sure there is a way of it being done. Um, but from a purely from an aesthetic point of view, it's not something that it's not something I would I would want to engage in for too long. I think I would get quite tired watching all this. Like it's tiring enough just watching sort of tweet like a Twitter wall at a conference. Um, whereas somehow if it's just on in the background and people just put it on, have it on in the background. Don't know why, but they do. Um, and it just sort of happens. Is that how people are are, u are using it? They're using it as a kind of ambient and in the background thing. Yeah. Some some are yeah. We we have a lot of emails from people saying that it just sort of plays. But the there are two really interesting. Um, things on that point, and one which, which is one I really like, a story, story I really like to tell, which is just before we launched, um, I was listening in, and, and you know, it's quite jangly sometimes, it's quite upbeat, it's quite a lot of short notes or shortish phrases, and I was listening about lunchtime, um, about a week before we launched the, the website, and it was really depressing, <laughs> it was really slow, all day long, and I couldn't work out how that would be, so I was sort of emailing back and forth and saying, I think it's broken, it's triggering old materials, old stuff, but actually it wasn't. Uh, it was the day that Etta James had died, and so it was this really kind of strange, you're hearing something and, and acknowledging, because it was just after I'd written it, acknowledging it was a sad entertainment theme. It's like, you rarely hear that. Like, that was something we didn't really think we would need. Like, Justin Bieber's had a haircut would be positive, mm -hmm. funnily enough. Um, but, yeah, you rarely get negative or sad, specifically sad, entertainment news. And so I was just thinking, this is all really low, and like cello, some kind of low chordy stuff. And yes, yeah, so and then I went online and found out what it was. It was quite a nice kind of flipping, flipping round of, of that kind of engagement. Um, but yeah, people do just have it on. Oh, the other interesting one was um, the Golden Jubilee. So we don't have a royal theme because the BBC News website doesn't have a royal category because they're on the front page. I'd love to speak to somebody in um, news about this. I have, a, I have a profound insight into what actually happens. It <laughs> triggers the politics music because right. the, everything the royals do gets comments from the opposition and Downing Street. So actually, Golden Jubilee was almost like 70% politics all day long. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit interested in the, in the kind of the mapping of words So we've got, we do have keywords um, which have been pre-selected, uh, which will do that, but they're more, so for example, um, we have keywords in those key themes, so politics, David Cameron, um, Downing Street, those sorts of things will trigger specific entities. Generally, it, and that was, that was quite fun. Um, but um, also all the emoticons, I was very specific. All the emoticons, all the whoops, lols, LMFAOs, all of those, they're all covered. <laughs> um, there's also a nice, um, yeah, I'll, there's another nice little Easter egg in there which, which a couple of people in here could trigger um, if we all did it at the same time. But the point of your question is no, we don't. Um, it's looking at vowels of those words. So the word cry, it would initially trigger k, and it would probably, I mean, it could do that as a violin imitating a k sound, like a, a nut, um, or it could be a clarinet going k, or it could be a singer going k, and then r would be again, and then i would be on a, a string instrument. So it will assemble this kind of so texture. So you expect to hear the same word played the same way? So if it was cry, 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 yeah. no. Um, firstly, because firstly because you wouldn't ever get that. I mean, you, you wouldn't have that as a as an example. 
um, it, largely because the context changes. So you need all the parameters to be the same. So it, that would happen if you were following one person and there, were, there was no context, but with context, no. Um, so, so yeah, it does keep redrawing itself, um, which, which does make it for a kind of rain man appearance when we say, oh, it's politics today. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you talked about sad entertainment, but mm. um, did it go through some frenzied phases during the Olympics when the entire country was, say, watching one person or and responding maybe to that well, in a very unified way? It, it would play. It played a lot of the sports theme. It also talked. It was a lot about. Um, there was a lot of talk about education actually around that time. Um, a lot of government policy about sports and education. Um, so a lot of politics was coming. Funnily enough, a lot of people were talking about the Olympics. It wasn't the majority. No. Of we're following a proportional, we think proportional split of okay, a very small number of British people, but it was you know identifiably playing. The sport thing's got this kind of da 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 dum ba da da dum bum da 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 dum ba da da dum bum ba thing. It's quite fun and kind of upbeat, um, and it was it was triggered a lot, but not so much that anyone else would really get annoyed by it. So that was that was interesting. It also it doesn't just play whole it, it it doesn't just play the theme tune. You know, there isn't there is a theme tune, but it's broken down into oh God, I don't even know how many bits. Um, each note, each rest, each instrument, each each note can be picked out as a discrete bit. So it could go da dum and that could acknowledge Olympics, for example, or sport. Um, but then also that it could trigger a silence. So in the second oboe part, it could be that it's got da 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 da, and if it just happened to trigger silence and ah, uh, it's going to sound a bit weird. But that does give us the potential to make it last forever. <laughs> and if I were allowed a second yeah. one, it would be if we're all sort of communally grumpy in the morning, yeah. and therefore just giving a sort of sad or whatever. Very often in normal media consumption, you know, like the Radio Free Breakfast show, you might actually want something that is actually taking you to another place, uplifting, hopefully gently moving mm. you on your way. Whereas, of course, if you were listening to this, you could sort of be confirmed <laughs> as to where the mood might actually be yeah, at that I point. And I'm just wondering whether that you've had any feedback about whether consistent listening of just going with the flow like that mm. is sort of does what an art form perhaps is meant to do, which might be to lift, to inspire, to, to move you on? Um, I think off the top of my head, I would say it's more observation than provocation. Mm -hmm. So it's less about making people happier when they're sad. You know, it's not playlisted, it's not, and we're getting up to 11 o'clock, so people are going to be pissy, so we're going to make them happy again. Here's Black Bell's Cannon. You know, it's, it's not that kind of thing. Um, it is more observing. One other thing we did did look at as a kind of model for this um, was the mass observation movement, which was a British um, sociological experiment, I think, 75 years ago. I think it was the 75th anniversary this year. Um, and so it, it was about observing rather than provoking a response. Um, but it's a nice, it's a nice point. Um, the, the big question we've Got, I've got at the moment is ends on October the 31st, and I don't know how we're going to cadence it. <laughs> it doesn't really feel very satisfying just to turn it off um, or just to fade it out, but ultimately, that's probably what's going to have to happen, unless we can kind of game it on. I wanted to sing Daisy. Yeah, you said it. <laughs> and every geek in the world groans, and everyone else is confused. Yeah. Do the people who you're following know? No, they don't. We, we decided not to tell them. Um, it was a big, it was also something we left off the Arts Council application. <laughs> um, but it was a big decision. Um, but we didn't want people to be able to game it. So I know who's on the list. Well, off the top of my head, I don't, but I know kind of key people who are. Um, and every once in a while, you know, we've got some quite cute Easter eggs in there. Uh, so my, my personal favourite is um, I was in a hotel just, just before we pressed play. And uh, there was this really large American guy, and he he was expressing he got he like called the waitress over and everything at breakfast, 
and wouldn't stop going on about how good the orange juice was. And I don't, know, I don't know about anybody else, I've never had an opinion about orange juice. Like, it's functional. Orange juice exists, right? In my humble opinion. But, um, so yeah, so if, if positivity and orange juice are expressed, it triggers a five minute sample of me walking down to the shop, like an iPhone recorded, me walking down to the shops, buying a carton of orange juice, pouring a card for orange juice, and drinking the orange juice, and going, mmm. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's very, very rare. I don't think it has triggered, I don't think it could. It would have to be quite a lot of people getting very excited about orange juice, uh, which I don't believe could ever happen. So, you know, I, it's the risk I run. <laughs> Given they're, they're British, though, we could get sort of someone on today to say, okay, everybody tweet positive things about orange juice because we're about to pick up <laughs> enough well, of your cohort. Could be nice, but I think if we've done our job right, then proportionally people wouldn't be listening, so we, we probably wouldn't notice it. And we, Dan, Dan Jones is a clever little man. He reckons he's nailed it so we can't game it. Um, yeah, so it would be fun to try that. And I, I would like to try and work out how, if we could do that, because actually something like Radio 4 would get about 10% of each of the 10% of each of the eight groups. And it could be, that could be enough to spike. Um, especially if part of the discretionary 20% of Mr. Stephen Fry. You know, you know, if we could get that kind of interest, that could be quite good fun. But trying to work out how to end it is, is something I'm sort of enjoying at the moment. It's more of an academic problem. Your mappings are all there quite, it's quite a literal mapping, isn't it? Mm. You, can you imagine, uh, a, a set of version two that has a less literal rap mapping or, or a sort of contradictory or even a random mapping? Um, yeah, I suppose you could. I mean, I think the thing that's, the reason I still think of this as a uh, kind of an abstract piece of music, despite it being quite literal, is that the back end is absolutely literal. Like it's letters, consonants, emotion, topic. Like that's what stuff is made up of. Um, but the thing I like, the thing I'm quite excited about with like, version 2, is what if you change the front end? What if you change the material that's triggering? And that would change a lot. Um, so this just happens to be my opinion of, uh, you know, the music of politics is completely arbitrary. Like it's just a piece of music that I wrote times 8, and then all the various other chord sequences and other parameters are abstract. They're just music, bits of music. I liked and I wrote and I wanted to hear played. Um, the yeah, so to get variety, you change the front end. I think I think the back end is quite. I like I like that it's kind of predictable because then when it turns out something you're listening to, um, you listen to it. It's, it's got it's got an identifiable quantity to it, but it's still you don't. It's not a literal front end. It's a literal back end. So I would I would like to try. I'd quite like to get another composer to write the front end. I'd like to get someone else to go through hell and back. <laughs> I think that could be really interesting. Completely different genre. Um, you know, get a kind of hip hop version, get a, a blues version, a jazz version, uh, whatever. Um, I think that could be really interesting because then you would really get. And the other one I'd quite like to try would be different time zones, different countries, different sort of national flavours. Because um, you hear the day turning really well, and like you hear the transition from morning to afternoon to evening to night, it's absolutely obvious what's happening, like time of day. Um, and so that's really nice. Um, so that could be quite fun as, as the sun moves around, you know, could be quite nice to hear that. Um, don't quite know how you do that, but no, you know, without just being noise. I can imagine it. It could be cool. It does some kind of cable channels almost, like that, isn't it? You well, it's like the ultimate three, red button, three, isn't it? Three, it's like the ultimate red button, you sort of cycle through like <laughs> however many countries there are, 205. Are there 205 buttons on a remote? <laughs> Does anybody have any more questions? What did you bring to the again? Before or after? Oh. <laughs> no, they, they really, they are brilliant. They are really cool. They're lovely people and they're brilliant. Um, it was a very uh, fortuitous and um, appropriate introduction to be made to them by Mr. Bill Thompson, um, who sort of 
said, oh, I think you'd be interested to speak to them, you'd be interested to them. So uh, they, they really enjoyed it. I think when we were recording it, it was thankless material. I mean, really, um, I was very happy to be sitting and not recording it all day. It was really thankless. Because it was mechanical. It was, it was, the music was written so that it was so, actually, another bit of naivety, it was written to be so simple that I thought they could not make any mistakes. But the problem was it was so simple they didn't have to concentrate. And so after eight hours, even going like da 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 da, you just start getting like stupid mistakes. And they're even more frustrating because they'll do them again and again and again and again. And it's really hard work. Um, but they loved it and they loved the we've had a lot of press for this. Like it's been a very good profile piece, um, if nothing else. Um, but I think they're really excited by the possibilities and, and being involved in in something which which they wouldn't have had kind of buy into before. You know, it's a slightly weird concept to go to a, an orchestra with. Um, so that was the kind of freedom we were afforded by by the Arts Council and and uh, you know, space was to to actually go for, for that scale rather than me and five of my mates. <laughs> or you and a synthesizer. Or me and a synthesizer, yeah. Or yeah. So yeah, the actual depth of it was, um, but they they really they do some really interesting projects as well. Like they do really interesting things in their own right. Um, you know, really interesting collaborations and, and all this. But I think this was still quite a step to go and explain it to them. I still remember sitting in their boardroom and explaining it and saying well, it's, it's kind of just a big piece of music. So if, if you're happy to record just a big piece of music, we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't need to know bits and pieces in between. <laughs> so yeah, but no, they, they were really very easy to work with. So. I think we might have come to a it's natural fun. end of our own. Yeah. Thank you, that was really fascinating. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Everett.